Well, hey, by 11. We're plowing through the chordates here. We've gone through fish, we've moved through amphibians, and now we're going to move into the reptiles, which is a really neat topic because there's so much to discuss. Uh, we're going to jump in uh, head first here. Looking at the site, there's some really great stuff to check out. Of course, we're going to have our, our video lesson and, and notes here. Come down here and you really need to take a look at uh, neat animation, which is an overview of the reptiles, snake digestion. Uh, there's a nice little YouTube video for you there. If you're squeamish, <laughs> don't watch it because it does a neat overview of how snakes' bodies are able to, uh, are so well adapted to eating such large meals. And um, interestingly enough, all of these reptiles are ectotherms and they don't have to eat very often, but when they do eat, who watch out. Blood squirting defense mechanism. That's a really neat one. Um, that's with the horned lizard. A little bit of fun there. The deadly Komodo dragon bite. You can watch an anaconda uh, give birth. And neat, uh, it's kind of a neat thing here. We're almost getting towards uh, uh, internal bearing of the young because the anaconda is one of the few members that's ovoviviparous. Now, what that means is ovo, meaning egg, egg live birth. So their eggs hatch inside the body. Now, you don't see that very often with a lot of reptiles. Most of, you think of sand, um, think of the leatherback turtle, rather, and those eggs hatch uh, once they've been left on the beach, and then the little critters enter sort of the, the whole realm of living on our planet, but not so with the anaconda. They're born actually inside the parent. So it sort of, sort of shows you what's going on with the uh, sort of evolution of birth. Really neat little video here on snake venom. But I digress. We've got a lot to get through, so I'm going to get to it. Okay, so when we look at the extant or currently surviving orders of reptiles, there's four that we need to show you. Okay, first one, crocodilia, crocs and alligators. And what do you need to be a croc or an alligator? Well, it's pretty wild. Most reptiles, and I do mean 90%, have four chambered hearts or rather have three chambered hearts, pardon me. The crocodiles are a group where they have a fully four chambered heart. Now think back, the fish had a two chambered heart, amphibians had a three because they had one ventricle. Most reptiles have a three chambered heart, but once we get to something pretty advanced like a crocodile, the ventricle has a septum that runs all the way through it and we have a four chambered heart. Extended jaw with socketed teeth, neat when you look at their limbs five digits on the forelimbs but only four on the back and they pretty well hang around water crocodiles testudines you look at these and there's the turtles and the tortoises right off the bat you're going to wonder what's the difference tortoises are land-based turtles are aquatic and in order to be a testudine the first thing you have to realize is turtles and tortoises can't leave their shells and here's the reason why because the body is, well, let's put it this way. The vertebrae and the ribs are fused to the shell. They, they just can't get out. They've got sharp, horny jaws with teeth. Um, interestingly enough, the tortoises are terrestrial, where the turtles are aquatic. You get the idea. Squamata is a group uh, that comprises the lizards and the snakes. We'll get into a lot of details on these guys, but they have to have their limbs at right angles to the body. And squamata are pretty advanced. The heart is almost four chambered. Um, the ventricles are starting to septate or sort of becoming um, just about four chambered, but they're not quite there. And they have these dry, horny scales. So pretty neat. You might wonder why are snakes put in squamata? Well, snakes have vestigial limbs that are at right angles to the body. You just can't really see much that's left of those limbs because they've evolved to do without. And lastly, this really neat little group, Rhynchocephalia, that you find down in uh, New Zealand. And the living example, the really neat one that I'll go over, is called Tuatarin. And Tuatarins themselves, um, they've, unlike the crocodiles, they have socketless teeth. Um, and interestingly enough, on top of the head, they've got a third eye. If you've ever heard of something called the third eye, it's the concept that we have this gland in the middle of our in the middle of our, our brains as, as, as humans, um, and a lot of mammals, of course, have it too, called the pineal gland. 
And it's, when you look at the tissue, it's very similar tissue to an eye. And the rhynchocephalians have a third eye. And in the juveniles, you can actually see it on top of the head with a cornea, a lens, a retinal tissue, and everything. That's a really neat group. But we've got a lot to get to. So I'm going to push right on with our information. And we'll get down to business. So let's turn on reflection. There we go. And we'll get a bit of this information down. All right, so there we go. Cute little guy. So in order to be a reptile, uh, it's a little bit different. What you never see in something like an amphibian is you never see scales or claws. So let's look at what it takes to be a reptile. Well, here's why they're uh, terrestrial. One, they've got dry, scaly skin. So I'm going to put a note over top of that. Dry, scaly skin. Again, their eggs are well adapted to terrestrial existence. They've got membranes protecting their embryos, and there's also a leathery uh, protective shell around the outside of all of that. They've got lungs, so we're not looking at gills anymore. Now, they have the ability to be fully terrestrial because they can lay eggs on land, and those eggs stay watery, they're well protected. Um, that doesn't mean that all reptiles abandon water, right? If you think of uh, the water boa, for example, right? The anaconda, there's no reason for it to have not live around water. It's, uh, these critters are going to live wherever their food sources are best and where they ever have a range. But think of it this way. Now, their range is highly extended. And they're able to plow in land because they have these watertight, dry, scaly bodies and terrestrial lungs. They can lay their eggs. They're no longer uh, bound by the same limitations as their amphibian relatives. They can go entirely out of water and live that way if they so choose. The evolution of the reptiles is interesting. If we go back uh, and look at their origins, we think that there was... Um, this critter called the Thecodont. Okay, we should take a little view of that. Oops, let's pop out. There we go. And think of this as the ancestor that was first able to come up out of the water and stay up out of the water. And some of the earliest. Um, it, some of the earliest fossils that we can find of the Thecodont. Let's see here. This fella here. Pretty interesting creature, right? And think of amphibians as finally mutating, changing, and evolving to have waterproof bodies in a way where they can stay out of the water and they are able to lay eggs and they just didn't have to go back. So the earliest sort of reptile that we can find dates back to we're looking around the Carboniferous period. So that was a wet marshy dominant time for amphibians but as the world went through this tremendous global warming phase as the volcanoes were kicking out carbon dioxide which is a strong greenhouse gas the polar ice caps had pretty well melted and what began to happen is the Earth wasn't reflecting as much light back towards space. And it began to heat up more and more and more. And that swampy marshland gave rise to a very dry era. And the amphibians just couldn't survive the way that they had. It wasn't a marshy Earth anymore. Now it was very dry. And we get the rise of things like the dinosaurs. Interestingly enough, we have a couple of varieties of dinosaurs. And there's, there's two here, and I don't know if you've ever um, heard about this. There's some with lizard hips and some with bird hips. Now, the bird hip ones, called the, the Sorosthitians, right here, um, interestingly enough, we, they have hips like birds, but they're not as closely related to the birds as the, oh, I'm not going to get it here, as these guys are. Uh, our Sorosthitians are more related to our birds than our little bird-hipped friends down here are. Okay, the Ornithischians themselves have bird-like hips 
and it, it what it what it matters when you watch birds walk the, they walk in a peculiar way because of the where their pubic bone is so I'll just show you that for a second I'm gonna pop out and I think I have it here and where is it right here okay so if we look at an allosaurus which is a lizard hipped variety versus stegosaurus which is a bird hip variety what you need to focus in on is the pubic bone now in the allosaurus you'll see a bone that's a little bit um, anterior towards the front of the head there and it makes sort of like a sort of looks like the letter a well the front leg of that bone that's the pubic bone and it's facing forward and because it faces that way um, these critters were able to bicycle their hips a little bit easier now when you look below at the ornithischian pelvis you can see that the pubic bone is fused um, with over basically with the overall pelvis and it made for a very different kind of hip bone type structure okay interestingly enough even though the ornithischians are bird hipped they've got hips like birds they're not as closely related in lineage to birds so the lizard hipped ones are more like the birds I know it's amazing but birds have more in common with those dinosaurs we see the uh, crocodiles the pterosaurs right so these were if you if you went back in time of course uh, let's go back to the uh, Tri Triassic Jurassic Cretaceous eras these would represent more or less the reptiles that you'd be seeing now birds themselves began to evolve kind of pretty well at the end of the age of the dinosaurs they were an interesting evolutionary version of where reptiles were going so are mammals when you see this the concept of the uh, chordate body plant starting to radiate out and take on different forms now the crocodiles and the sorcician dinosaurs the ornithischians and the pterosaurs you have to ask yourself what happens when you're perfectly adapted to your world and then something horrible occurs oops right and what I'm talking about is the asteroid impact which happened 65 million years ago now that marks the difference right here Ooh, give me my pen there right here and at this point you'll see certain things just go out of existence the dinosaurs pterosaurs there goes the pterodactyl there goes our friend stegosaurus and our and um, allosaurus and all of the dinosaurs pretty well die off at this point because they could not handle the asteroid impact which created essentially nuclear winter on the planet now where did the asteroid hit let's pop out for a second okay let's go to Google Earth and I'll show you where it, the impact was it was in a place called the Yucatan Peninsula now that's down in Mexico let's see here Yucatan Peninsula there we go and I'll hit clear all right so let's do a little orientation um, this is the Gulf of Mexico and the Yucatan Peninsula a peninsula is a body of water uh, sorry a, a body of land that's surrounded by water on three sides and the asteroid hit about where I'm placing this in the middle it hit um, on land and a bit in water and by a bit it's, it was quite a large asteroid and what it did was flash boil the water so if you're a dinosaur hanging around anywhere in the Gulf of Mexico you had a bad day because you would have been incinerated by the tsunami that was soon to ensue it also threw up a tremendous amount of debris uh, dust things like that into the air and that's what causes the equivalent of a nuclear winter and dinosaurs weren't able to heat their bodies their ectotherms when we look at reptiles th that's what they do they don't have to eat as much as we do um, ourselves and birds have tremendous metabolic demands because we're heating our bodies but the dinosaurs and reptiles for that matter didn't have to do that uh, if you think about a snake it only needs to eat once in a while because 
it conserves its energy and it doesn't waste it on heat output. However, if you can't heat your body and suddenly there's a nuclear uh, winter condition on Earth, you're just not going to be able to survive. You are not adapted to your environment. So the Earth went from a very dry place to basically nuclear winter. It was very cold. And 65 million years ago, that gave the opportunity for these little rodent-like critters, these little mammals, to burst onto the scene. Birds were also heating their bodies. But we know that some of the original lizard, um, or I shouldn't say lizard, to say that out of place, reptilian class survived. Of course they did. Let's pop out of this. We say, well, what survived? Let's change our pen color. Well, first of all, our crocodiles here, they survived. Very good burrowers, probably hunkered down uh, around the equator and just waited it out. Okay, good mud burrowers. They were able to survive, not because they heated their body, just because they rode it out. Birds, if you think of one called Archaeopteryx, we know the birds were evolving, most likely off the Thorstician line. They were able to heat their bodies. They carried forward. Some of the reptiles that were hanging around in warm parts of the world did just fine. And turtles made it as well. Okay. So what does that leave us with? That leaves us with the rise of what we call the Cenozoic Era. Oops. So if denote that with a large C. So the Cenozoic Era began um, with the asteroid impact. It changed all the questions. And now each uh, critter had to evolve to basically answer each one of those questions. If it had the proper adaptations, it did well if in its environment. If it didn't, it died out. The asteroid impact certainly changed the questions. This was the, put a line here. There's our, whoops, come on there. There's our Mesozoic and our Paleozoic. Cenozoic, Mesozoic, Paleozoic. So what would it have looked like during this era? Well, we go back to our plant lectures. This was sort of the time of the giant tree ferns and things like that. There, You don't see any humans running around here. Um, the oldest fossils of hominid skeletons go back maybe 4 million years. Let me just back up here. At this point, even at the beginning of the Cenozoic era, we don't find any hominid skeletons. All that we can really find are these little rodent like skeletons and that's about it and then that begins to radiate radiate out into all the other mammals that we see in modern times but anytime you see a, a, a movie like a uh, where there's dinosaurs and these humans being carried off by pterodactyls take it with a grain of salt not too many humans back then neat slide that talks about the bird hipped and the lizard hipped dinosaurs right our primitive birds Let's follow that. Appear to be going off this line right here. Sort of puts them in line with the pterosaurs, doesn't it? There's our little thecodont ancestor down at the bottom. So I won't spend too much time on this because we've already discussed it. Adaptations. Well, reptiles had a lot going on. They had really well-developed lungs. And they weren't breathing through their skin like the amphibians. So their lungs developed because they had an important job to do. So well-developed pulmonary system, double loop circulatory system. They were really good and remain quite, uh, quite gifted at this up to this day. They save their water and they don't, it's not like they don't produce urine like we do. They produce uric acid. It's very uh, concentrated urine because they have to retain all the water they can. Powerful limbs. Uh, when you look at their pelvic and their shoulder girdles, they're extremely well-developed and they practice uh, internal fertilization begins to show up. So it's kind of neat. It, it begins to appear around this time. Um, it's just an effective version of fertilization, not such a shotgun strategy. And those shell terrestrial eggs have, uh, we call them the amniotic eggs. 
they have membranes to protect uh, the growing embryo inside and to keep it hydrated. That double loop circulatory system is an interesting one that I wanted to point out. And I'll just do a little drawing on that. A double loop circulatory system, if you look at your, and I'll just draw it down here. If you look at your heart, I'll just draw it like a box to save a little bit of time. One side of the heart, as it turns out, which is the left side, now left and right are backwards when you're looking at downwards at the heart. Pretend you're a, a patient lying down on a, a slab. When the physician comes in, right, you're, when they're staring down at you, it's, it's reversed. So when you go to draw it, you should, you should draw it that way. So on this right side, we'll say this is the left atrium, left ventricle. And on the left side, because it's facing up, we'll say right atrium and right ventricle. So the purpose of the two sides of the heart are very different. The right side is all about sending uh, blood to the lungs. I'll draw the lungs, two little sacs here. Upwards to the trachea. Okay, the right side sends the blood to the lungs for a recharge. The left side sends blood to the body. I don't have enough room, so I'll just write the term. There we go. And the right side is all about recharging, and the left side is about getting it to the body. Um, this is a very effective heart structure because you've got each side of the heart with its independent job doing what, exactly what it needs to do. Recharge the blood, get it out to the body, recirculate those nutrients, carbon dioxide exchange, oxygen ex exchange. Um, and once the, once the four-chambered heart develops, you never really see critters on the planet going back. And if you're wondering where it develops, the four-chambered heart sort of starts to develop in squamata. They're getting close. The ventricles are starting to septate. And then once you get to things like the crocodiles and the alligators, they have four independent chambers. Very advanced heart. Now, for body temperature control, you got to realize that reptiles, they can't heat their bodies, and we've kind of mentioned this. So they have to rely on behavior to control body temperature. What does that mean? That means if they're cold, they'll bask on rocks, get warm, go up to the pet store, you'll see uh, the behavior with the, the iguana. It'll sun itself. If it gets too hot, it'll take steps to cool down, go in the water, etc. More or less, you get the idea. They they don't waste all that energy on heating their bodies. And that's 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 an interesting strategy. Uh, as it turns out, um, it sort of cost them because they were dominant uh, in the age of the monsters, right? The Mesozoic era. And because they couldn't heat their bodies, right? Um, well, we could say we here, we as humans, um, as mammals, rose to a, a greater state of dominance because they just couldn't handle their environment, right? Natural selection. So when we look at the body of a reptile, we're going to dissect our friend the turtle. You'll find it's an amazing thing to try to blast into. Um, it's The shell is cut um, along the side. Um, well, it's, that's the only real area that you could open them. And once you get them open, you'd be amazed at how uh, crammed their internal organs are. But we're going to see things here that we've seen traditionally. Uh, Well-developed heart. The lungs. The lungs are hard to find. Um, in this picture, it's a little bit deceiving. When we crack open um, our critter and we're starting to move through all the organs, the lungs are, are very much dorsal. They're very near uh, their shell. So you have to get a lot of the organs out of the way before you can see them. The liver here. Is, is drawn quite small. It's actually very large and sort of a, a large C shape. It's one of it's the second largest organ in the body to the skin. Um, you'll see that as soon as you open it. Digestive tract, you've got your uh, small and large intestines. Bladder, now there's some turtles, um, or rather tortoises, 
that can absorb water back from their bladder if they need it. That's a pretty interesting trick. We can't do that. We get dehydrated and if we have a bladder full of water, we can't do anything about that. But they can. Um, certain uh, species can do that. Paired kidneys, and that's about halfway down the body and very much, um, very much dorsal. And then the cloacal area, which is right here. Now, the cloaca, uh, we saw that in our amphibians. And you'll see the cloaca even up to and including the birds. So the waste products, the reproductive products, eggs, sperm, etc., they all go out through the cloaca. And remember, this is a concentrated uh, urine that they're producing, uric acid. They're not very wasteful. Let's look at their eggs now. We say that most reptiles are ov oviparous, so let's define that. Uh, and I don't want to use black, so I'm going to go back to blue. All right. There we go. So if you see ovi or ova, that means egg. Oop, work for me here. And viparous means life. So life from an egg. Life or live, you get the idea. A live egg. So now that's one strategy. Lay the eggs outside the mother's body. And um, even though there's internal fertilization going on, the eggs are being laid externally. So the male's depositing the sperm inside the female cloaca. When we look at the uh, the egg itself, it's quite a feat of nature. Uh, when you examine the amniotic egg, when, when we're born, we're born uh, as mammals inside of an amniotic sac. And we're not like birds and we're not like reptiles. We don't have to have yolk because the placenta in mammals is hooked into uh, the mother's uterine lining and it's exchanging nutrients that way. But this is a little bit different. There's no placenta here. So the amniotic egg has to have uh, a yolk sac in order to be able to provide nutrition. So that's that. You've got the yolk sac down here. And you've also got something called the allantois. And you'll see that it's highly vascularized. Now in us, the, the chorion and the allantois, they're all fused together to become uh, basically the... Uh, our umbilical cord, right? But in these little critters, what they have to do is they have a membrane that goes around them, um, a couple of membranes, the chorion, and they've also got the amnion, which is protecting them. And they have to, they have to um, respire. And that's a largely a function kind of of the allantois. And there's also, uh, you also get waste products built up. But this is highly vascularized. And it's able to exchange enough carbon dioxide and oxygen for the developing organism to survive. So pretty neat. You can see there's your chorion. I'll help define that. There's that membrane, right? Your yolk sac um, and your allantois. And it, it also is picking up some waste from our little critter there. So they don't produce a, a ton of waste, but that tends to grow larger and larger as they develop. But you can see all those, you can see all the chordate characteristics when you're looking at our little friend here. We should point them out, right? We've got our postanal tail. We've got our pharyngeal pouches. We've got the notochord, which becomes, sort of degenerates, is integrated into the vertebrae. So there's a lot of those characteristics are just right there. They're just staring you right in the face. We just have to look at the development. Okay, so we looked at the different orders already. Lizards and snakes is squamata, All right? So I'll just sometimes a little hard, but I'll just do a quick little bit of writing here. Squamata. There's our crocodilians. These are our testudines, and tuatarans are our wrinklecephalians. So I'll just use the first letter of each one. And these are the existing orders. Remember, kingdom, phylum, class, 
So we know that we're looking at class Reptilia, and these are just the next more specific organization of them called orders. Now you might have heard the term lizards, so I'm, I'm going to lay one on you here. All lizards are reptiles, but not all reptiles are lizards. Lizards are um, inside of order. Is it going to let me write or is it going to give me grief? Okay, these are in squamata. So we call them squamates. If they're in that group, what is it that it, you have to be to be a lizard? Okay, sure they've got four legs and they stick out pretty real right out to the sides. But in order to be a lizard, they kind of have these long bodies with these long tails. They've got clawed toes and they have external ears, movable eyelids. So they're a highly kind of specialized group. Now remember that, external ears, movable eyelids, and generally kind of a long tapering tail. I'm going to pop out of my uh, reflection here for a second and show you a few things that I have for you. Now I think, no that's not it. Here we go. So when you think of things of this uh, that are in this group, right, lizards, you should be thinking about like the chameleon right? Movable eyelids, long kind of fused tail, limb stick kind of out at right angles. There's a nice example. I'm just going through a couple of Wikipedia ones here. Marine iguana. If you've been down to, uh, down to Mexico, you've, um, you'll see these guys. Pretty interesting little critters. Don't panic. <laughs> They're largely herbivores. And even our monitor lizards fit into this group. Now, those aren't herbivores. But movable eyelids, you can see uh, there's the tapering tail, limbs sticking out to the side, right? All the characteristics you would expect. If we kind of look at order crocodilia, um, and we look at some of those critters, right? There's some pretty huge ones. Like you normally see the American crocodile. When we think about that, right? That's a sort of a standard one. But... Um, the crocodiles, the caimans, the alligators, and saltwater crocodiles, I think of these down in Australia, um, these will eat you if they catch you. And crocodiles themselves, um, saltwater variety, they're able to osmotically balance their bodies. They can overcome that strong salt content um, by, um, it's an interesting mechanism of releasing tears into their mouth, heavily salty tears, and essentially spitting out excess salt water. So they can live almost anywhere. And I'll tell you, I wouldn't be swimming in any um, Australian rivers. Not anytime soon. No siree. Uh, just a second there. If we look, I wanted to show you a little bit about uh, tortoises and turtles. Um, pretty interesting range. You can see here, pretty well um, tr uh, tropical, subtropical. Um, when you look at a turtle, right, this is what you should be expecting to see, okay? Um, they're not, um, they're not going to spend much time on land. They might crawl up onto the beach to lay their eggs, but that would be about it. If you look at a uh, tortoise, you should be thinking about this. There you go. Heavily, um, uh, heavy ability to conserve water on land and, um, don't go putting your fingers anywhere near that. Snapping turtle. Some of these can just be uh, can be just nasty, but um, interesting scutes, right? And you can see the growth patterns on them. Uh, very neat shells. So, I'm gonna pop back now. I'll go back into reflection, but I just wanted to show you a few examples of of what it was that we were talking about there. Okay, so snakes, those are also in order squamata. No legs, but they they do have um, vestigial, sort of like little leftovers of legs. 
Um, it can be as small as just a, a, a little um, growth off to the side of the body. Let's look at um, vestigial. There you go. Vestigial snake legs. So I can show you what I mean. If you look closely, you'll see these little barbs. There they are. along um, some of the regions of the snake. And you'll say, well, what is that? That's really all that's left of their legs, just these little barbs sticking off to the side. So once upon a time, they did have, uh, their ancestor would have had legs, but they've developed in a way where they're just more efficient without it. So there's a neat shot of uh, basically the uh, human to uh, snake comparison with the pelvic girdle. Right, and you can see the different adaptations. Uh, we've gone in different directions. Very efficient predators. Check out the video that we have online um, uh, showing that snake. It feeds on a deer, and you would think like you would. Snakes are pretty interesting because they can move their upper jaw relative to the brain case, and they can obviously they can tilt their head back as far as they need to, just about to bring in prey. Now, how do you breathe when you do that? Interestingly enough, if you watch the video, uh, they have an, what's called an evertible or an extendable uh, windpipe. So they can stick it out to the side and it's like a snorkel while they're eating. It's, it's something to see, I kid you not. If you ever looked at a snake, you should make a note that they they don't move their eyelids. Uh, there's no real external ear openings, right? You see them, uh, you'll see the rattlesnakes, for example, um, tasting the air with their tongues, right? Checking for prey. There's our crocodilians. Now the crocodiles are the ones with the long, broad snouts. Um, pretty huge. That guy's pretty brave to be playing with a crocodile like that. Um, they'll take down very large prey, uh, including ourselves, right? So alligators, crocodiles, they all fit into this group. And um, get into our uh, testudines, our turtles. There's We've obviously seen the aquatic version, right? The turtle. And we've seen the um, terrestrial version, which is the tortoise. And terrapins, is kind of my favorite. If you go to a pet store, you'll see them. Um, they can live in brackish water, a um, little bit salty, and interesting pets. One thing you got to remember with turtles, though, um, there's native bacteria on these critters, and it's salmonella. So if you ever handle them, you have to wash your hands. Okay, now for some specifics. When you look at their shell on the back, right, it's technically known as their carapace. Now the shell on their ventral surface, on their tummy, that's called the plastron. And it's been used to make shields, obviously really uh, strong material, right, uh, bony. The head and legs emerge from those, uh, basically from the carapace and the plastron, just kind of at these um, uh, merging points. But you got to remember, they can't, these critters can't leave their shells. Their backbone and ribs are fused with the carapace, so there's there's no way out. Tuatarans are fabulous. Um, an interesting little group that you find off New Zealand, right? And they're, they're very lizard-like, but they lack external ears. Uh, they have those primitive scales, and I wanted to show you this third eye, which is just fascinating. Um, it's a pineal gland in us, and it has, it has a lot to do with our sleeping patterns. As we get older, uh, the pineal gland, sometimes called the parietal eye in these guys, um, that's kind of in the middle of our brain, mammalian brain. But th by the time these guys grow up past uh, sort of the juvenile stage, it's gone. So what is its function? Well, we think it has... Um, one of the things that our eyes are able to do is is to produce vitamin D. So we, we sort of think, well, that's interesting because that has a, a lens and a cornea and retinal cells in it. It's very much the, the similar in tissue to our eyes. So what is its function? Does it help them perceive polarized light? Do they know what time of day it is? Um, in us, it's very important uh, with our sleeping patterns. A um, little bit of production of melatonin but it's sort of an interesting evolutionary leftover. And if you're wondering about these tuatarans, where are you going to find them? That's it, right down there in New Zealand. They're 
once a large proud group and they've been reduced to a really small uh, representation of what they originally were. So let's see here. Go back to reflection here. There we go. So not much left of that group as we say. Holy smokes. Well, that brings us to the end of our topic, uh, chapter 31, section 1, of the reptiles. Um, this has been quite an overview. There's a lot more that we could have gone into. Um, if if a, a group of students was interested in doing reports on these, there's just a tremendous amount of diversity and information that you can gather on all these orders of reptiles. I hope you guys had a good time. Uh, it was an interesting topic for me. And... That's it, folks. I'm out. Have a good one. We'll talk to you again soon.